All right, folks, thank you for coming uh, to end service. Uh, we're going to try to make this, you know, like we used to do. Uh, we're going to try to make, a, make a, a good effort to getting y'all some monthly training so that y'all hear from uh, the training division and, and other folks uh, with important information that you need. I want to uh, give you an update on a legislative situation. Anybody who follows me on Facebook uh, has seen me post this. Uh, they've made changes at the legislative level federally for the, the, the Controlled Substances Act. Part of those changes inadvertently removed our ability to give Schedule II through V narcotics uh, via standing orders or protocol. They've proposed an amendment to that. Uh, it is sitting in subcommittee right now. Uh, I'm going to send a link out to everyone after in service is all done. And um, I'm going to ask you to follow that link, read up on the bill, and please click the thing to send a note to your representative that says that you support it and you're asking him or her to support that so that we don't lose our ability to push these medicines over protocol. Because if we have to go back to calling for orders for everything, you know, especially if you're going downtown to a trauma center and stuff like that, or, you know, just coming over here to Fayette when they're, uh, you know, condition red or anything like that, getting somebody on the phone to approve orders is going to be problematic. So y'all please stay up to date on that kind of stuff. We'll try to make sure that we keep feeding you that information as it becomes available. Speaking of diversion, <clears throat> uh, everyone got the e email I sent out a couple of weeks ago with the, that was excerpted from what the hospital sent me. Um, they're, they're really asking us, please be diligent in explaining what diversion is and what diversion may mean to the patient. Um, I know many years ago we sent out the cards, the diversion cards, they were laminated, big uh, ugly green yellow paper and we asked you to read those and some people consider that an insult to them uh, as paramedics or maybe too elementary but let me tell you this is the script that was agreed upon between us and, and the hospital and it, it's the honorable and the right thing to do for us to say, do what we say we're going to do. So if we say we're going to read this script to them, we need to read the script to them. Or at least let the patient read the script and explain to them, you may have wait times of several hours to be seen by a physician. You know, with this in mind, you still want to go to Fayette? Do you want to go somewhere else? We'll be glad to take you, you know, anywhere within our service area. Um, I can tell you that if Fayette goes down, that Southern Regional is usually going right down behind it, so your choices will be limited to get to be close to Spalding, Noonan, or going to um, downtown. So, with that being said, just understand that um, that we, you know, uh, as, as training administration and the chiefs are aware of what diversion costs us in time and man hours and unit hour utilization statistics. So we're keeping an eye on that and uh, we're, we're still working with the hospital to try to limit the diversions. If the patient says, no, absolutely, I don't care, we're going to uh, Fayette, we're going to Fayette. Uh, so that's not going to change anything. We're just trying to make sure that you guys don't get ugly receptions and things like that. And if you do, you know, let it, let it slide off, report it to your supervisor who will pass it up the chain, we'll handle it administratively. Don't, uh, don't get sucked down into a, a war of words with someone. Any questions on diversion? I can tell you one of the things that we're not having to deal with that they're dealing with in Columbus right now is wall times. So you, who knows what I mean by wall times? Uh, wall times of th three hours or more. So um, Columbus Fire and Rescue is actually posting uh, a truck uh, with an officer on it up there to manage the, the interaction between the patients and the other ones. And they've actually had to, to lease stretchers to put their trucks back in service because the patients aren't coming off the stretchers for hours. So we're not there. That's a good thing, because uh, honestly, systemically, I don't think we could we could absorb a three-hour wall time. So, um, as as bad as it may seem, we're not as bad as, as some other places. Uh, let's see what else. House bill diversion, physicals. Uh, the folks that responded to my email requesting information on any issues you had with your physicals, thank you very much for those. Um, Chief Bartlett and I met yesterday with the uh, chief medical and, and scheduling and, and uh, operational people of PIC. Uh, it's a new ball game <clears throat> for them. 
Uh, they are, are the largest provider of these type of services in the state of Georgia. Uh, they've got a, a good medical director by the name of Dr. Yost. Dr. Yost was in Atlanta, in Metro Atlanta. Uh, he was a paramedic for 13 years, also a flight medic with CHOA before he went to med school. So he's kind of like got our back with some of these things. Uh, one of the changes that'll be made is that um, if anyone is got uh, has an issue where they were, will not receive their clearance, for duty before they're referred to another facility, Dr. Yost is going to personally look at those those files. I think that is a tremendous thing. So uh, I know that there's been some issues in the past. Um, we're we're going to kind of go into this eyes wide open this year, really looking for some improvement. I think we'll see some improvement. Um, but if you have issues, forward that up through the chain and let us know that uh, you're having those issues. But let's try to work with them as much as we can. Uh, the Chiefs work very hard every year to keep you guys uh, able to get those OCMED NFPA 1583 compliant physicals. Um, several people in their responses are like, why do we stay here if there's issues? I can tell you this, just to be transparent, your physical costs $265. The next closest competitor to the same thing was over $500. So we keep looking for this. But every year, it's a budgetary issue to make sure that you guys get that. And the chief fights very hard for you to make sure that you keep that. Because if you were to go to your own personal physician and take that thing, he'll sign it off. But you're probably not going to get a spirometry test. You're probably not going to get a treadmill 12 lead. You're not going to get an audiometry. You're not going to get these things that you really need to be 1583 compliant. So granted, the county says you have to have a physical. We're saying we want you more protected. You need to have this kind of physical to look for these things. Again, I'll mention Facebook. You know, go to the county Facebook page. We're gonna start, start posting some more information out there. But did you know that when it comes to things like testicular cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, these type things, you guys are anywhere between 12 and 120 times more likely to be able to get this than somebody who's not in the fire industry. So we're trying to make sure that you guys are, are part of a system that's watching you every year in looking for subtle changes. Questions about physicals? Captain, what else am I, is that it? Okay, all right, well before I go, do y'all have, uh, y'all have any questions for me? I'm gonna turn this off. All right. Let's focus on EMS now. Uh, how many of y'all sent an email about six, eight weeks ago about the changes in the National Registry and I recommend you go in and look at it because it's all different now. How many of y'all did that and did you see what I was talking about, how it is so, quite different? Uh, this was all driven by the National Continuity Competency Program, which has been in the process of building for a couple of years now, really several years. And what they did is they identified a uh, list of objectives <clears throat> that the national uh, across the nation that we should work on as far as training goes for the next four years. So you already do these same objectives for two research cycles. So in that, it's real specific, and I'll pull it up in a minute and show you what I'm talking about so we can relate to it. But it's, it's specific on what training we need to do. We're used to it was trauma mandatory, trauma flexible, medical, mandatory, it was very broad, but there's on the um, mandatory, there were specifics there, but the flexible could be anything, right? Well, now it's pretty specific on the national, what they want nationally for us to focus on is very specific. So another thing that drove us getting together in a classroom, and, and I want to be, I'm dedicated to making sure we give you as many avenues as you can to get the training hours to maintain your certification. Um, we all know that it's been stated, and even at the national level, it says it's individual responsibility. But to me, we have an obligation as an organization to, to give you as many outs as you can to get that. Um, in the past, we took and built stuff to meet the description and the objectives of those, um, the mandatory and flexible trauma core on the Moodle system where we had material there you could go on there and view, uh, take a quiz, and you get whatever credit we had down there for that. Uh, the other option, of course, which still in place is the 
in A&P courses that we offer in-house that gives you a big chunk of your hours. It did before and it will now as well. When they came out with this new national uh, program, they became very specific and identified distributive education. And distributive education, to not be distributive education, such as online learning is distributive education unless you have like a live web conference and you have an instructor where you're in live time with the instructor where you can ask questions, the instructor can call on people, and so forth. So with that being said, the way that the Moodle set up is strictly, it is distributive education. You can use distributive education, but in the slide in a second I'll show you, or the, the brochure I'll show you, it lays out how much of your training can be distributive education. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drive these in surface by meeting these objectives. Now, the one that we're gonna do, the three topics we're gonna talk about today once I finish this part, is more, I'll be honest with you, it's probably focused more heavy on the paramedic side of things, but there's still something that you can gather from an EMT level. So we've, right now we have several, let's see you and Scott are in paramedic school, is that the only ones? And then, uh, you know, Jason and Chris, Rich, you still, you register as an EMT now or paramedic? Okay, so, but there's something that you'll gain out of this. We're gonna talk about pain management, we're gonna talk about IV fluids, which that applies to everybody, and then we're gonna talk about uh, some, the routes of medications that we carry and how we give those, such as IV, and we're gonna focus more on the sub-Q and the IM methods. Everybody's gonna get the opportunity to do that. Uh, but right now, I'm gonna pull up some slides, and this is uh, the main page when you log in here to National Registry. And if you go right here to General Information, is a good place where you can go back and pull this information up and look at it. But right here it says NCCP recertification. And this is where a lot of the documents that I have already printed out, such as the National Continued Competency Program for Paramedic Education Guidelines. Inside this is more or less the basic material to at least that needs to be covered uh, for the national scope. There's one for EMP guidelines and so forth, so you can go there. And I'll come back to this page in a minute because I want to show you how the AMLS and all that relates to this. Uh, right now I'm going to sign into mine so I can pull up some more specific stuff. You go here and you go to manage education. Used to at this point I'd be looking at the trauma, I'm sorry, you look at refresher training or continuing education, then you open that and it would say the uh, trauma, mandatory, and flexible, and same with medical. Uh, if you go here to the national and look at show details, now look at, if you, I'm just gonna scroll down and you see the specific, uh, specifics that has about the hours, how many hours you will spend in each one of these many topics. So if I get down here, you see I've got some greens in there, checked off already, that's cause I, I entered me in the first day, and I've got credit for it, so those three topics are checked off for me. This will be the same thing as you know, all of you that are here today. That are is everybody here at National Registry to some level? National Registry, okay. So everybody in here will have training entered by us in National Registry and also in FirePoints. So we'll take care of that for today when you're in our classes. The AMT one looks, of course, my, I'm, I'm paramedics at my level, that will look similar to this and have different objectives to meet as well. So let's go back to uh, right here, this recertification brochures. And I'm actually gonna pull up the, since there's more EMTs in here, I'll pull up the AMT. And you wanna make sure you look at the NCCP. RJ, this is where yours is gonna be a little bit different because I think you're still gonna be under the old system until you recert. Once you recert, and if you don't, if you don't upgrade to AMT, then you regress back to an EMT and you'll have to meet that NCCP. So let's look right here. This is kind of a broad categories of what you got to have in the, where the uh, bold numbers are there, 462625. This is your national core curriculum that you got to cover. For an AMT, it's 25. For a paramedic, it's 30. If you look over here where you have these uh, subsets and broken down to partial hours and so forth, that would be those little check marks that I showed you all ago where one of my, three of mine were green. That's what that comes up to be on your when you look in to go enter your training. All right, down below that you have local continued competency requirements. That is what's driven from the local organization. It could also be the state. Uh, the state may mandate that we have training on certain things. It could be from a local level for protocols. It could be new equipment. Or it could be maybe where you, you would take and put some hours if you have anything left over 
from an AMLS or PXLS that didn't fit one of those other categories I showed you all ago, then you could fill that in down here because we do endorse those national classes since we teach them in-house. And then the last one is individual uh, competency requirements, and that can be anything. And this is where the whole distributive education I talked about comes into play. On any of these, I'm going to show you how it breaks down. At the very bottom here, the percentage of distributive education is the same for paramedic, where you have one-third that could be distributive education, such as getting a book or watching a video, uh, online learning class, such as the stuff we have on Moodle now, without a live instructor that you can use. So eight hours of your, tw uh, of your 25 hours on a national curriculum can be from that, eight hours from the local level, and then all of your individual. I know this is a lot of information at one time. Does that kind of make sense what we're doing? So what we're doing with these end services is driving it towards meeting the objectives first of the national core and giving you a lot of hours that are, are not distributive education. And then you can fill in the rest of your hours with distributive stuff that you can do on your own at the stations or at home or wherever you want to. For example, the people who miss today's end service, if I get the video, everything comes out good on the video, we'll have like a video they can watch. All the documents that we, are our resources will be posted on there. We do have a couple PowerPoints from uh, some of the topics we're covering. All that stuff will be put on there, so they're still getting the information, but it'll be distributive education, so it's going to go from that as an AMT. It'll take away some of the eight hours of time that it'll be applied towards, or a paramedic about has 10 hours they can use towards that. Next time, you guys might not make the in-service because you're off or something, but the information will be, still be there. Everybody's getting the same information. It just won't be live time for, for y'all. Now, uh, we may, if we start seeing people get in trouble down the road towards the end of the cycle, they're missing too many, then we might become creative and find a way that we have instructors in the stations. And as long as uh, Chief Folden and Dr. Robertson, the medical director, will sign off for us to have it say that, Jason, you went to this and you're an instructor uh, and you got the information from being here, and then you go back in the next shift you deliver that information to the people who missed it, then we'll count that as in-service and not distributive education because they actually have somebody interacting with them that can answer questions. I'm just trying to keep it clean on the forefront and see how this goes for six months or so, and then we'll look into maybe doing that so we can uh, make sure that we're affording everybody the, the opportunity to get the hours. Now, I mentioned a while ago about AMLS, and this is the big thing. We had some people that called uh, saying, look, I'm trying to move my hours because when you come into this the first time, I've already moved my hours, but it, normally when you come into this page right here, after you log in, you click my certification, there's a button, see where it says manage education, I believe it's over here on this side just below that or up above it, that says move hours. So when you click move hours, it'll go to another page and you'll see all the classes down at the bottom. Well, it won't be broken down at all. And one of them, if you've taken AMLS, as an example, it'll just say AMLS. Well, you have to go through and break those hours down and put them in the right place. Well, when this first came out back in um, April, I called, we called National Registry NAMT to see how we were supposed to do that. And at the time, they didn't really give us any guidance. Used to, you remember, AMLS was a choice. And you'd pick it, and it automatically filled those hours in for you. Well, either we just didn't talk to the right person, or since then they've put a document out. So let's go back. I'm here. I click General Info, and now I'm going back here again to this NCCP recertification. This is what you want to find: this standardized course is a national requirement. What it does is it takes just about all the classes that we have, that we offer, and then some, and tells you how many hours to use. So if we're looking at an AMT that took AMLS. Ten and a half hours of your a, of AMT class will fit, and this is where you'll go through and add the hours, okay? And then you'll choose lecture and put that in. This is the only thing that I really can't do for you because I can't log into your account. So when you start doing this, if you have questions or if you want to come sit down with me or Chief Folder or Lieutenant Babb or Lieutenant Callahan, then we can help you do this and pull it up and show you what we're talking about. Ten and a half hours of an 18-hour 16 hour class can be used. So you're looking at five and a half hours now that you can still use. And like I said, now you can go down to your local and put that in and put it as 
because that is uh, that fits because again we endorse those classes and it can be used and it doesn't have to be real specific you just put in the description AMLS and then other topics not covered in the national curriculum could be in your description and then just go in and put the five and a half hours and now you're on that way to be knocking out a lot of your hours if you take AMLS EPC PHTLS that applies now a lot of those check marks on mine when I pulled that paramedic also would be covered by ACLS the CPR that we do so those have places where we can meet and get signed off and get uh, billing hours too. Remember on your current or the old way was on there you had to have your ACLS was update and your CPR was updated for paramedics and CPR for the EMTs. Y'all remember that? That's not on there anymore. It's on there and it's covered through the objectives that you got to go in and put the date of the class that you took and the hours you'll just put description of uh, what class it was. For those, those are in-house, those are mandatory, we'll put those in for national registry when people attend or when we get them signed off. Does that make sense? This is going to be your best friend for any of those who've taken all these classes is this document right here. Uh, if you have a hard time finding it, please don't hesitate to call. Uh, I'm considering making a, a Jing on this, which what Jing is is more or less, y'all seen it before where you're watching like a, a tutor on a piece of software and you see the mouse and everything but you just hear the person I can record a screen and I might do that for this just to help you find where things are because this there's a lot of information on this website and it's easy to get lost so I might do that just to help you all out it'd be really good if I could get somebody to volunteer their first login in so I can show how to move hours I might do that with somebody who hasn't moved their hours yet but this is kind of where, where we're going I mean this is we put a lot of time and research in to try to do the best thing to offer the hours for y'all to get what you need to meet these objectives and we haven't got confirmation from the state because has anybody, seen, has anybody seen what the state wants us to do for research yet other than going in there and updating your information and print another card. I'm going to cover that in just a second. But this is the email that, that they sent out to everybody from the National Registry and it shows that as April 1st, the following states will implement the National Continuing Accomplishment Program for recertification. Well, if they're saying that the states are good at free certification, then it sounds like if we meet the objectives set forth by National Registry, then that should cover the state. Instead of us, we're used to, we had, we'd go meet all these hours for National Registry. Well, what does the state want? Most of it would transfer. Well, but guess what? Sometimes they'd want eight hours of trauma where we hadn't had eight hours covered in the other part or four hours of cardiac and eight hours of pediatrics. So uh, we haven't seen the, what they're going to do yet. I want all y'all right now to take your billfold out and see, pull out your state card and make sure it says that it expires in 2017 or later. If it expires, if everybody's done what the email said, which was a while back, you should have one now that says at least 17. This is your state license. If not, then you, I'm going to show you what you need to do. So I'm not going to get on anybody because it hasn't expired yet, but it's coming up. 17? Does anybody say 16? It does? Okay, let me show you what you need to do, RJ. Matter of fact, if I could print, I'll do it here. But uh, go to, uh, I just Google EMT, wait, Georgia EMT. Uh, I'm going to go in this right here. It's the uh, dph.georgia.gov EMS. So just Google that. It's the easiest way. And over here on the left side, you will find online medic profile update. You click that. Click here. I'm talking RJ has it. So I'm. Well, mine still says 16. Oh, it does? I've done this. Okay. But then. Exactly. You probably didn't. So you click continue. Then right here, you put your license number and your last four-year social or date of birth and last four-year social. If somebody's having issues with, you understand what we're talking about. Don't wait till March 15th of next year to go in the first time and start trying to move all your stuff over because it, it could be, it'll take a little bit of time and I just recommend that you go in and get familiar with it now. So if we just research nationally this year, are we going to be in offsetting years now? No, the way, to my, with the state, yes, the way it's supposed to work if I was given the correct information, 
is we just did this, right? And then what's going to happen is the state will get from National Registry, everybody who met the recertification and did everything got recertified, they'll mirror that up and they will send you another card that says 18, the state will. I'm in the same situation, that's what I was told. If I hear anything different, we'll definitely send it out. Um, sometimes there's so many emails that were sent out about this stuff that they confuse me even. Uh, so in the end, I think we're making everybody right. Pass the word. Really, there's no officers in here, but you guys take the opportunity to, and, and ask people to pull their card out. I'm not trying to bust anybody. I just don't want you to, you know, not, and then you end up after June 30th and walking around with an expired card in your wallet, okay? You're all legit. We just got to get your card printed, okay? Oh, it did come out. Good. Feel free if you want to call the battalion and go by and get that uh, laminate on the way back with Amy to do that. So no questions about this, that little bit of stuff I covered? Okay. Uh, so the first topic we're going to cover that, that's going to meet some of these objectives, and even though, the, again, even though this is more paramedic driven, I'll get you in just a second. Hold on one second. We make it work for the AMT because there's a section of the EMT that says five hours of other advanced life support education, and that's where I'm putting these hours at. The next month may be more EMT and we'll fit it to the paramedic. So we, they allow you to do that. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, because I'm in paramedic school, okay. can I use my paramedic school hours? Like, yes. Can I, yes. And, and how do I go? Okay. Your ACLS, remember the document I pulled up while ago? You'll plug that in there. The other stuff, here's where it can get, you might have to take and use it more as the, um, well, I would start with the national and go through and look at it. But what you almost have to have is a syllabus or something to say, how many hours did you spend on one of the topics that's on there? I'll give you an example. One of them is triage. And I, I know it's probably not something you spend a lot of time on in paramedic school as far as like mass, you know, patient triage, smart or salt or whatever you use. And I think it's 30 minutes or an hour on that. So you just got to look. You just don't want to go through and say, oh, I did that, cover this, because some of them are like two and a half hours talking about a certain topic. Just make sure it meets. If you have a, uh, so and a syllabus or an agenda or something, then pull it from there and enter it straight in. Because it was lecture, it's in class, and it's a great way to get your hours. Yeah. And then as long as you have that document, it'll cover everything. Okay. I think that was a registry a couple of years ago. Yeah. Don't wait until a year from now or something. Well, yeah. that's why I was just, I mean, that was processing. I was like, I yeah. Probably start doing that. Yeah. And you can get, you know, you probably have at least a, the week and just pick like the Monday or whatever that week if you look back in the syllabus and try to count. That's good. You know you covered it, so it, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so you can use those hours. And that's a great way to get knock all your stuff out. You should have no problem getting it. Um, but the, the first topic we're going to talk about is pain management, and uh, this is from a national scope. So there's going to be some things that we cover that, you know, we'll see like this, pain management, I think we're really strong on. I think we've endorsed everything that these white papers and research from the uh, um, National Association of EMS Physicians and the Academy of Pediatric Physicians. What they have put out are things, a lot of things that we're already doing. Uh, and more or less just in a, to kind of summarize these two documents that will be put on our, our uh, Moodle site that you can look at yourself, is that pain is a symptom, and it's the number one symptom that patients have is pain. And we have an obligation to take care of our patients and treat symptoms, correct? And we've, in, we've endorsed this a long time ago, and we've put pain management and pain management using medication to treat in a protocol. So we've kind of taken the information that, uh, that they talked about as far as this topic goes, and we endorsed it some time ago and got the approval of Dr. Robertson for us to have certain levels of medications that we can give without calling for orders to speed the process up uh, for certain patients. The, the other thing they talk about, when I, when I mention pain management, what's the first type of treatment we think about? Well, I just gave you the answer a while ago, right? Pain medicines, correct? But there's other methods that they talk about. I'll tell you what, RJ, what's your uh, date of birth? 10-62. And what's your last four, your social? 6231. 
All right, so we log in. All right, is all this information correct? Can you see that? Do you still live at 305 Chapel Road? Mm -hmm. uh, 770-714 is your number? So, okay. So I'm going to click. I'm going to save info. And then I'm supposed to be able to click here. I'm not seeing the link. Oh, I just, okay, I couldn't see it on here, my bad. So you click there, and then here's your card. So I'll go ahead and do this while we're here. There's your card. I'm going to right-click, print. Do y'all see your printer on here? It must not be hooked. It's the Office 451 PCL 6. All right. All right, well, it's part, I hope it doesn't go to dispatch. Well, check and see if that comes out. If not, call me later on, and anybody who has it, and I'll walk you through if you can't figure this out. But it's pretty basic to go in there. And even though I just did it for you, it'll work again. Yeah, I remember that used to happen. Okay, any questions? I know this, I went over a lot of information on this, but is there anything that on national radio? Again, I'm not calling you out, but do you check that before you give it pain management? Okay, you're good, you're part of the anomaly. I encourage you, all you guys have access to the same reports I do to look and see how many times that people are, are when you go down checking your protocol box, and saying you gave these medications by protocol, but then you go back and look at the vital signs, they're not matching up. Now, this is a guide, and I understand that. The thing that you said, the scale, I think we probably need to look at adding to this. Some type of scale where we can say the patient presented this way, and they identified and described their pain as this. Because isn't it possible for somebody to be suffering from pain and not have the ability to respond sympathetically with the nervous system. Isn't it possible that we take medications that kind of help keep our blood pressure down, such as beta blockers, and we don't respond like the normal person would, but yet do we just withhold pain medicines for these people for that reason? I'm not saying we would hold them. What it puts a difference is, is you probably need a call, okay? Got the patient presented this way, doesn't meet our protocol. However, I, he talked about the bill that's currently being addressed in legislation, correct? Being brought up. I'm just making sure that you were thinking of these ways before you take a patient to Emory Midtown or to a hospital we don't go to frequently, and let's say there's a doctor working there who's lobbying for this bill that feels, agrees with it, and they say you gave, you know, four milligrams of morphine or out total, and you've, uh, you didn't ask for orders for that. No, sir, I worked under my protocol. Okay, well, what's your protocol? What's the driving force? Well, hypertension or, or tachycardic. Well, then you look at your report and you don't have that in there. I recommend that we make sure that's in there or add the scale to say the patient presented with a scale with a pain scale of seven out of a ten, or they circled, you know, on a visual chart you may have that we show them where would you say your pain is, and it's a you know a different type of faces or it's a on a chart they can circle and point to. <clears throat> we address that and we document that. And then we give the medication, and then what, we need, what do we do now? Go back and reassess it, and we say it was a seven, or it was this, and now it's dropped here, and I benefit my patient. It's helped with their anxiety. It's lessened them, and they feel better. How can anybody argue with you, right? Because we've documented, we've done these other scales. I'm not beating this up and saying the protocol's wrong. I'm not saying that there's people out there doing things that are gonna get in trouble for, but I'm just saying we probably need to add another scale on here and if we're going to mark protocol as being that, then we need, to, we need to at least document some other type of scale to go along with that to justify why we gave the medication. Most doctors are going to give you the orders if you call anyway. This is just to save time and, and benefit the patient yeah, and much sooner. A good paramedic going to document that stuff that, you know, I mean, you do automatically before you're going to put your vital signs in before you get the Right. Hopefully, and I know it's not Yes, and, and, and I tell you, we were probably one of our EMS services, our uh, and service coming up soon is going to address documentation because 
if you look at reports, if you look at our policies, our QI policy is more directed at making sure we don't make errors that would cost us from getting paid or overcharging patients. We are going to develop a QI process or get better at QI and that does more about patient care as well. Because I don't think that we're doing, me and Chief Fulton's talked about this and you know, we really should have a, a committee that, that you know, identifies any pe people that are in cardiac arrest or any high acuity calls and start there and then work down from there. But I think when we're reviewing reports, any of y'all who review reports or are caught upon to review reports, don't just look for errors about mileage and stuff, but look at stuff to see what's going on with the patient. Because we know what it looks like when you read a report, if they didn't document the pain scale above and below, I mean before and after, then they didn't do it in our mount, in our minds, right? So, question? Uh, part of that is like your rapport with your patient too. Like your pain scale may be completely different. Exactly. So part of that's just your patient assessment on, yep. you know, finding out actually who your patient is. Right. And that's why we don't need to say, okay, only people that have a five or higher on a scale of one to 10 gets pain medications. Let's say, for example, me and uh, Rutherford, we two, two different kind of lifestyles. He's more of a millennial. He plays video games and stays inside more. And I'm rough and tough and jump fire barrels and get all, do all kind of crazy stuff. And I've, got, I've had a broken femur, I've had back surgery, uh, a broken arm, and the worst thing that's ever happened to him is he was outside and got stung by a bee. So when you say the worst pain you ever had, some people just have never experienced bad pain. So that's exactly what you're saying. However, we're there to be you know, a guardian and, and for our patients and do good things for them. So, we have to do our due diligence and look for people who are seeking pain medications, but I think in our area, in Fett County, the patients we go, that's a very small subset of the patients we go on. Yes, they're there. You have to look at it, look at what medications they're on, look at their history and so forth, but, and that's something in this document that they talk about too, but I think we don't run into that that much, so uh, I think especially the levels that we're going to give the meds, we're okay. You start seeing a reoccurring thing, this person's got the same pain, then we need to address it. So talking about treating pain, we decide we've, we've splinted, we've put ice, we've done all this other stuff, but a lot of times we do it before we'll go ahead and go with the pain medication, right? So we have choices. What are our choices in Fett County for treating pain with medications? Morphine, morphine, fentanyl, and Yeah, morphine, fentanyl, and Toradol. For some people, one of the days said, well, you do use nitro. Well, nitro, the pain relief is a secondary effect of vasodilation, and oxygen is also something else, but you know, typically we're gonna do that. So let me ask you, you've got a patient, they got a broken femur that's been splinted, uh, and you're gonna give them some pain medication. You have a choice, right? We just said it, you got morphine, fentanyl, and Toradol. They meet the protocol, but the protocol doesn't say you one or the other. What's the driving force that says morphine, fentanyl or Toradol? There's no right or wrong answer. I'm Paramedic asking you. Preference. Paramedic preference. Mechanism. Okay. Um, severity of injury. Oh, that's pretty much the mechanism. Um, pain level, allergies, vital signs. Okay. Those are the four main things. I'll All right, so you say vital signs. If they've got like a 100 systolic borderline, let's say they're 100. I'm more apt to give fentanyl. Yeah, because fentanyl, good, because fentanyl doesn't affect does it cause hypotensive as much as the Toradol, yeah with okay all right a whole bunch of stuff. all right now all right so hey you know and typically if you look at the research out there they say that fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine if you watch the news you hear it because people are fi figuring that out on the street and they're like hey this stuff is better than morphine and it and it's must be more potent, but when you compare the amounts to amounts, yes, you're giving micrograms versus milligrams, so, but you're giving a lot more. You, don't, you see what I'm saying? You're still probably giving about the same, but fluid to fluid, it's much stronger. So, but fentanyl doesn't last as long as morphine, does it? So I was very good. Right. You just got to pay attention to paramedic school. And that's one of the things to think about. Uh, you're going to Piedmont Fet, they're hurting, they got an eight out of 10, give them some fentanyl, it's gonna work fast, but probably by the time you get there, wait to get triage and you go in and see their, the doctor, they're probably gonna be due for it again. You're going downtown, they're really hurting bad. Give them fentanyl, if you, that's fine. But be thinking about, you might be thinking about that other 100 
microgram dose and route. Just a sidebar, if, you're, if I'm going downtown with a patient I've given fentanyl to, I'm not going to give them morphine on top of that. I call and get orders and oh, yeah. my report. Right. If I use that extra 100, fine. If I don't, that's right. fine too. Um, that's one of the driving force I would think about though on this is if you're gonna have a long transport, think about morphine. If not, fentanyl's been shown very safe drug. It, you can give uh, recurring dosages of it and the patient will never get hypotensive, but never know some patients are more sensitive than others. So anytime, just like any medication, but really on these narcotics, we give it, what do we need to be doing real soon after that? Reassessing, reassess their LOC, reassess their respiratory status, make sure their effort's not getting weak, we're not suppressing it, reassess their blood pressure, tachycardia, their uh, pulse rate, everything, and document it. They do good with that, then they start hurting, hey, how's your pain, reassess them about their pain scale, still there, then go on to something else. I see some people, I don't know if you've ever done this, that give morphine and then they come out and give fentanyl, or they give fentanyl and I'm like, I don't know if they're just not getting a response out of the morphine, uh, and then they go and give the fentanyl, but, you know, I haven't seen anybody have any adverse you know, effects from that. Um, the other thing, there were some people that talked about uh, personal preference, but when you get into where you're gonna be giving your morphine out of a two-bec syringe, and you know, you gotta give them you know, 0.1 cc or however much you're given, can be hard to read. So what some people re do, said they do, is they draw it up in a three cc uh, flush and give it that way. That way they say if they bump, they hit a bump going down a row, you don't give them that, as much and, and, and uh, cause other issues. But to me, I felt like that was an extra step. And I said, personally, I never did that, but if that's what makes you more comfortable, then that's fine. It was just an extra step. I just don't, I recommend that, you know, try to get your drugs the first round and right in, when you're up uh, before you leave. And then make sure that you're not, you know, watching your traffic and try to make sure you're in a nice smooth area before you go giving any drug and not bouncing around. Um, the, the other drug that we, uh, I'm sorry, on fentanyl. When fentanyl first came out, we heard about this a lot uh, when we started using it because everybody's pointed out. And there's a condition that you can get from giving fentanyl. It's, more, it's not common, but the pediatric population is where the one that's most common is, and that is the uh, rigid chest syndrome. Y'all heard of that? Yeah, and, and why it's more, common if you take it and you get your you draw up your correct dose and if you just push it real fast there's more chance that they get that in their body racks and it gets real stiff and they can't use intercostals and cause breathing difficulties um, so it's recommended that when you're given fentanyl that you push it slow I mean as slow as over 30 seconds to a minute I don't think we're doing that I think you're okay just use caution don't get in the habit of, of slamming it in especially on pediatric patients and if if you do, or if you notice a patient has trouble breathing, that could be what the effects are. So what can we do for that? Okay. Give them some Narcan. Make sure that we do that. Uh, Lieutenant Babb's gonna talk more about delivery methods in a minute, but I wanted, did y'all really know that you can get fentanyl through this, atomized? This probably is a great alternative to a tool we no longer have with nitrous with your pediatric population. You've got somebody who has a gross angulated fracture, you need to move them, you need to splint them, Think about using this on a pediatrics or anybody in general before you have to about getting an IV. Last thing a kid wants and already hurting is you go sticking a needle in their arm, right? But this will probably help with pain and probably help relax them somewhat. Uh, so consider this as an alternative and he'll talk more about that momentarily. Um, earlier I heard it, we said, well, if tor well, we got Toradol, but that's more for kidney problems. That's always in my mind too. The only time I gave really Toradol when I was on the truck was for flank pain or associated with kidney stones. Um, Toradol is a good drug. It's not, the one good thing is you, you can help relieve some pain and not put them in, under the influence of a narcotic. That's one, it doesn't have near the side effects that the uh, opiates have. The, uh, there are some concerns though with it is number one, as always, ask for allergies. So if I ask somebody for allergies, there's a good chance they're not gonna say, I'm allergic to Toradol. But if they say what, would I need to say I need to hold off of it? Yeah, any kind of NSAIDs. They say all NSAIDs. Ibuprofen has aspirin. Aspirin, of course, has aspirin. Then they're allergic to aspirin and NSAIDs, and I don't need to give that and move on to something else. But maybe once, because I'll be honest with you, out of the three, toward all is used the least. And we go in spurts on the others. We'll go real heavy in fentanyl. Right now, we're in a morphine trend. 
and we're, we're just nailing out morphine. Um, but think about Toradol as an option for some of your lesser pain. We said severe pain for the others. You know, you got somebody that has a dislocation or a fracture, but they're not really, you know, maybe they're a four, you know, or three, or they're, they're, they're maintaining a good vital sign. Then consider maybe giving some Toradol. It's going to be longer acting. It's safe. Um, we just need to use caution with our early population more than, and the recommendations that's in the protocol. It used to be a little higher than this, but we've reduced it now uh, to where it's 55 or older that we need to reduce that first dose. Instead of going with 30 milligrams, we cut it in half and give them 15 because as we age, we become more susceptible to kidney failure and we don't want the kidneys to have problems breaking down or, or uh, absorbing this uh, NSAID and causing kidney failure. So cut it in half. If you want to give the second dose, you need half of that. You need to call for orders and give the second dose, and the max is 30 milligrams anyway on a, on a uh, elderly patient. Yeah, it's toward all, and he's going to go over the routes, but that's another one you give IM. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to steal his thunder to several of them. The other only other part I wanted to cover in this. We went through this, we've gotten a lot better as we went through a spout where if we gave morphine or if we gave fentanyl, we were given Zofran and we saw it all the time. And granted, they might do that in the hospital, but we talked to Dr. Robertson about it back several years ago and he said, don't be give, we, we're not in the, in the business of giving these, these medications proactively, we're reactive, okay? Um, so you give it to them, you can tell them this might cause some nausea. If it does, let me know. And if they say, hey, I'm getting nauseated, then go ahead with the Zofran. Um, also, this was, I, I don't know if uh, anybody would think about doing this, but I remember back several years ago, we had people talking about how they just love, we had, used to carry Finnegan, and they would take the Finnegan and draw it up and then draw the morphine up with that and make their little cocktail and go pushing and they thought it worked. We don't make cocktails, we're not in the bar business. I hope nobody's doing that with Zofran, but there's no study research saying it is, and it's definitely against anything that we recommend. So if, you, if you're doing that, stop. If you just want to doing that, stop. I don't think it's an issue now. I know at one point in time it was, but uh, document, 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 reassess, reassess. That's what we're driving for today's theme is making sure we're reassessing these patients, all patients, but specifically these ones who we're dealing with, uh, with that we're giving narcotics to. Do you have any questions about that stuff or for me? All right. Well, if nothing, then what we're going to do now is take a quick break, give us a check it, second to switch out instructors, and we'll get. Said they'll go ahead and get a flush, put all that medication up in there. The, the fentanyl might be a, a, 
you want to do that, man. That way you just do that slow flush. It's easier to do the slow flush for that. Again, it just depends on how much medication that you're going to get. Length of the needles are important. When you get the needles, especially the 1cc syringe, how long is that needle? Is that going to be long enough to give an IM injection? Probably just going to have to take it off as soon as you open it up. If you give an IM, if you want to look at the patient, there's going to be a little chart coming up. It'll tell you, well, for an adult, you'll use probably these sizes of child or these. If I'm giving Jeff a, an IM injection, I could probably do a, an inch, inch and a half. Thing. If I have old granny at the nursing home that's on that beer round, am I going to do the same size or am I going to do a small one? And here's a little, kind of gives you just a guideline on how to use. But again, this is going to be patient dependent. Always treat your patient and use your patient. Just don't go by the, the standard guidelines. Whenever you get ready to do it, go ahead and get all your stuff ready to go. You know, we're, we're in a little bit more of a, an emergent situation that you're going to try to get the medication up and get it, get it in on board on the patient. But go ahead and make sure that you're, you're getting your stuff ready. Make sure, especially, you've got the correct medication. You know, that comes up from time to time. You pull the wrong thing up, but make sure you got the right dose. Double check that expiration date. Um, especially when you're dosing and your medication, you got to double check that. Most of the time, you're going to be riding with an EMT. Tell them what you want. You know, tell them what you're giving. Let them look at it and just double check it. This is going to be more if you're working at a facility. A lot of facilities want you to actually put the manufacturer a lot number and all that on, on your documentation after. But that's not that big of a deal with us out in the field. That is an option that you have to add that. Make sure that you document where you gave the injection and who, which person on the truck gave it. If you want to use your 5R, make sure you're giving the right medication to the right patient. You're giving them the right dose at the right time via the right route. And the route's the biggest thing we're talking about today with uh, doing more of the emergency type stuff. Pretty much when you go through class, everything is given IV. Have you tried to get it on board for it, with the majority of our medication? This is going to give us some alternatives, but sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Make sure you're cleaning the site with a chlorohexidine. When you get, when you clean the site, and this goes especially for IVs, when you clean the site, make sure you let the site dry before you start it. If your patient's unresponsive, no, it's not that big of a deal. It's not going to hurt them when you stick it through, but it just pain, pain wise, it makes it a lot less if you'll let it dry first. <clears throat> got the different techniques we'll be using once we get up here for an IEM. C is just you're just kind of spreading it out. You've got the uh, bunch where on the sub Q you're going to kind of pinch it together so you can get into the site. Just a couple of different methods to help you administer the medicine. And once you go in, you put it in, you, uh, a lot of people you're going to see, especially for the first time, they're just going to get it, just want to kind of ease it in. You don't want to do it, you're still want to knock it, knock it back. Aspirate and then give it. You'll see some bend the needles. You get a construction worker, you get somebody with sickle cell that's had sickle cell for a long period of time, and then a lot of times their skin is going to be leathery. And I've actually seen it where the, the needle bend for a good bit, trying to get the needles in. From IM injections, you're going to give it that 90 degree angle when you go in. On the sub Q, you're going to go with a 45 degree angle. When you're on scene, of course, we're never going to recap the needles. That uh, you know, safety hazard, we don't want to uh, stick ourselves with it. When we're up here practicing it a little bit, we're going to use the same ones over and over. Instead of just getting it like I just did, and put it back on there, try to remember to leave the cap sitting on the table and just scoop it up with it. On the field, don't even do that in the field. Just go ahead and put it straight and sharp. And paint. <clears throat> Apply that pressure to the site. Um, you can put a Band-Aid on. Make sure that you're doing your records. Big thing is make sure that you're reassessing your patient and that you're documenting. Okay, you know, beforehand the patient was like this, I gave medication, now the patient's like this. You know, do you see any changes? Do you see any kind of adverse reaction going on? Do some of the demonstrations on the, uh, the IEM, you're actually going into the muscular, or into the muscle. That's why you're going at that 90 degree angle. When you pinch it up, you're pinching that area up to where the, the skin's there, but if it gets away from the muscle some, and kind of put some of the subcutaneous tissue there so you can get it to that level. We're not going to do this. This is when you get your TV test and you put the little web in. That We're not going to be doing that type of stuff in the field. 
and just going to kind of go through some of our medicine with the, uh, the epi, that how many people will give it sub-Q on a regular basis? We give it for allergies, sub-Q. Um, the thing they're kind of recommended now, anaphylaxis, is, you know, for anaphylaxis, go ahead and give it IM. That with mm -hmm. epi, epi is absorbed real quick, you get a reaction. But in the, the emergency setting, now they're saying go ahead and do it IM. They One of the things you can do sub-Q, there's a chance of it leaking out a lot more, and that way when you go IM, you get that full dose in, get a little bit quicker action. Um, one of the other arguments you'll hear people say is, why don't I just go ahead and go IV and do an epigrip? You can do it, but their argument for doing that is, okay, if I give an epigrip, they're going to get it a lot quicker because they're in shock. So when they're in shock, then they're constricted, their extremities are constricted. But when you're having an allergic reaction and you go into shock, what actually happens to the extremity? That's the one that's just the opposite that you actually basically violate. Atropine is one that we can give IM for organophosphate poisoning. We don't carry enough to really do much. Maybe on a little kid or something, but on an adult. That's not even truly the starting point. You probably started more around four or five. Go from there. Uh, Benadryl, give it IV, IV or IM. You know, you might have that patient that you can't get a line on. <clears throat> so you can go ahead, give them their IM, and then go ahead and give them their Benadryl IM. That glucagon can go IM or IV. Lasix. Um, back. Glucagon IM. Suck. Do what now? Glucagon IM. That would suck. Yeah. A lot of uh, yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's the reason we have it really. You can't get an ID. So. And and two, when we open these, get these arms out. I know some people haven't seen how the glucagon is. They've seen the little red box but never opened it. We've got one in there that you can see. I mean, just a little syringe, a little vial in there. Um, the Lasix is one. I've been a paramedic for about six months. Uh, had a pulmonary edema that really needed it bad. And we were down here, I think it was down in Brooks, and Fayette didn't exist, and we had to go up the southern region. Couldn't get a line started, go all the way up and get to the hospital. Well, why didn't you give LASIK? So at school, my little drug card had LASIK's IV and nothing else. And it's like, well, I couldn't give it because I couldn't get an IV. LASIK is one, if you get that situation, you know, now yeah, you can go IO, but on the patient, probably not going to go IO if they're conscious, unless you just have to. It's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to take about 15 minutes or so for it to start to take effect. But if you're going from here down to there and you have a long transport, it's going to start working before you get there. So at least you're doing some good things. <coughs> Max sulfates, you can give IM or IV. Uh, morphine, you can give IM, IV, or you can give it intramason. You can do the mist for that. Narcan. With the Narcan, a couple years ago we did I can't remember if it was in service or if we was doing four pumps or something. But Narcan has kind of gone back and forth. It's gone from originally you gave that in 0.2 increments and to you had an effect. And actually when we first first started carrying it, I think you go up to 0.4 and that was the max dose we could give. But uh, when you're giving it and you're going to be giving a lot more with the heroin and all that's out there, you don't want to bring them back. Let the hospital do all that. You're going to bring them to the point they're breathing on their own and that you do their eyelashes, their flutter. You know, yeah, it's gonna be hard to judge. You'll give 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, give a little bit at a time. Give it about a minute in between. But if you have somebody that's, uh, that you just messed their high, they might not have too fun of an experience in the back of the truck. So it's just, just give that small increment and bring it up. If you're giving it intranasal, you know, you don't really have that problem, that it's not gonna bring them up as quick. You're not, with IV, it's getting there pretty, pretty much immediately. And it's going to bring them out of it. But internasally, it's going to kind of absorb in a little bit slower, right? And so you'll be able to uh, deal with it a little bit easier. Uh, and internasally, also, that might be something they carry with them now. That's, families can get that if they have a family member that, uh, that needs it. Uh, let's see. Sign a bed problem, you can give IV, IM. Thiamine, you can give IV, IM. Does anybody really give that anymore? We don't even have it in our truck anymore. Oh, we also finally took it off? I, well, I never got the clarification. Because we let it expire back in February and nothing was ever resent. Okay. I'll double 
check on that. Um, that used to be, that was back when we were doing it years ago, that was the uh, automatic if you have a person unresponsive and you give them a D50 that you automatically get the time. You got away from that and you went more to, you would try to get a history and they had history of alcohol abuse that you would give. And, and it might have completely faded on the outcome. That was on the sheet that they gave me that was still on the, the drug sheet. So yeah, that's all they included on there. Toradol. Um, like I said, when I broke my back, broke a bunch of ribs, that the Toradol works. Went, went to the little clinic, did all that. First thing they did, they actually gave me 60 milligrams of 730. But they went ahead and gave me the injection. And, and it didn't get rid of the pain, but it made it more I could tolerate it. And I had to drive it and have a, a ride, so I was going to have to drive home. Um, but again, that's an option. You can do it IV or IV. Valium. This is a mis mistype or a typo that you can't give the Valium intranasal. That Valium is the preservative that, or its carrier is actually an oil-based product and it will not absorb properly through the nose. And so you can give it IV, you can give it IM or anything. You just can't give it intranasal. Versed. Versed, you can do IM. You can do it IV, you can do it internasally. If you have this little kid season, you can't get a or you have an adult having a bad season. You know, that might be something with the uh, the verse head that you could go with. If you can't get that line going, you can give it rectally. That, you know, in an emergency situation, we're probably not gonna go there because we've got the internasal. This is just giving you another option for that. Another one that you can do that we went to in the field that you might use for conscious sedation in the clinic you can actually mix it with a little bit of, of juice just to knock the flavor off and make it drink it. It takes about 20, 25 minutes for it to take effect. Some of the things that just kind of show where some of the injection sites are. With a child, if you can get the parent to hold them or get a coworker or somebody to sit and actually hold their legs in between yours so you can hold it close. Remember, I am, you're going down into the muscle. You don't really want them moving around a lot. Kids going to see that needle coming, they're going to remember when they had their shots, they're not going to want it. They're going to be moving. So you want to try to control them. But you're going to go the injection site there on the side of their leg. A little bit bigger kids, you can go on in the delta. Um, FE again, we're going to swap over now and start doing that. I am. Another site when you're doing sub Q on children on the leg, you can do the same area. When you're doing it on the uh, adult or child, you want to go to the back of the arm. Think of the old women that's got the bag hanging down. That's all so you can just tissue. We have it, it's just you don't see it as much. And that's just the area that you want to go in back. Again, the rectum, we don't give as much anymore. If anybody even gives it at all. It used to be liquid Tylenol that you take by mouth. That's, that was on the truck. And if you had a kid, actually you'd draw up their dose in a syringe, put an IV catheter on it without the needle on it, and actually give it rectally. They, they kept, contain, uh, kept complaining about how bad it tastes, so we quit doing that. You're not having to worry about the, uh, the fever as much as we used to. There's been new studies out. It's not the fever that kills the patient, it's whatever the infection is or the, the virus that they have. <clears throat> Again, just got the infinagel. We've got one up here if you have never messed with it. When you're drawing up medication, this sounds stupid, but you say it because somebody did it. When you uh, draw up medication, put your filter needle on there, draw up your medication, dispose of it properly, and then put this on. This is not for drawing up medication. That is somebody that doesn't work here anymore, I'll still not say the name, but yeah. they're EMT pimp tonight too. Oh, I'm just like uh, They're they're EMT pimp tonight the other day that they saw us doing it. It's like, what are you doing that for? Don't you draw it up with that? Well, so and so, that's how he always did it. We still haven't figured out, did he have to break something off the lid or do, how, how did he get it in there? Again, when you give it, you're going to give whatever your dose is. If it's going to end up being two cc, you can give one cc in one side and one cc in the other. Make sure the harder you push it, the more, the finer it gets. And it's going to take some little resistance. You can see it's such a fine amount, it's going to take a good little bit to go. You might have to do two or three attempts at it, but they might irritate the person and they might pull away, so you just kind of watch it and see. All right, the EpiPen. Did he ask you to check on that yesterday? 
Oh, the, the other ones, I forgot. He, he asked me, but I didn't see it until I got back here. So I will uh, I will run over there in just a minute and or after lunch and see if I can't find something okay. like that. Um, We've got some trainers. These do not have needles. We're just going to kind of go through the basics of it. And this is the older one that we have. They're pretty much the same as the new one. They look just a little bit different, but they're going to work about the same. Um, carry them on the trucks. One of the problems we'll have when we get them, they come in a box like this. It's got two of them. The, uh, the expiration date is going to be on the box, and it's going to be on the pin itself. It's going to be in a container when y'all get it, but hopefully when they send them out, they're going to write an expiration date on them. Without taking it out of that, that little package there, you can't tell what the date is, the way that they've done them. But he's, he usually writes it on there before he sends them out. If you're not sure, we had one yesterday asking about it, but he wasn't sure on his. I asked if he could open it up and look. Yeah, you know, when you open it up, open the container and look at it, this is still got a seal on it, so yeah. you're still good. All right, they come in two different uh, strengths. We just carry one, but you might go to somebody's house. You might go to the school at the clinic or something like that, and they might have the EpiPen Junior. We carry the adults, carry 23 kilograms. The junior carries 0.15. 66 pounds is roughly the cutoff that they recommend. But if uh, if you have, you know, unless you're dealing with just a small infant, if you have a little kid that's 30 pounds, you're not you're going to help them. You're not going to kill them by giving them the adult dose. Probably going to be the biggest thing is the needle is going to be longer, and you'll get more of a dose. But if they're actually truly having that allergic reaction, they need to get that AP in their system. You're going to give it on with five. This is kind of in the news right now, and it's not so much us giving it, is it's going to be uh, the patient giving it themselves. What the patient's doing is they're just, or it's doing that. We did a, we were at a conference last year, and they actually had filmed it. They got a, had like a solo cup and put a paper towel on it, poked it on the cup, and taped and videotaped it. Initially, when you first hit it, it has a spurt, but it actually goes over five, six, seven, eight seconds and it continues to flow. So to get that full dose, you gotta put it on there and you gotta hold it on there until it, give it about 10, 15 seconds. Then you can pull it off. Um, it was, yeah, we got, it, within 10 seconds it was complete. But they're saying the people are hitting it and pulling out. If you do it, they jerk it. And something happens and it comes out, you're done. You don't stick it back in. Once it's out, it's out. But you don't know how much was given or anything. But you might have to just watch the patient and see if you need to give them more. Another thing when you give these, it's got a safety on it. You'll pull the safety off and then you give it. Don't be Jason Paul. Don't sit there and think you've got to push the button. You push the button and now you've got the needle that goes all the way through your thumb and it's working out this way. <laughs> going to use them, you think you need them, use them, but if this is one of those that if it's kind of questionable, don't just pull it out, open it, and use it there. He ended up saying it's like 250 for a pack of two is what we're paying right now. They're very expensive. I mean, if you need it, use it, but it's just one of those, just don't pull it out and have it sitting there just in case, make sure that you need it. Make sure the patient has the right symptoms. You know, you're going to get, again, some of these people get a little bit dramatic. Would y'all have a chance to pass them all around if you get one down there? Uh, make sure they've got some of these, the symptoms. Because you just don't want to give it to somebody that, uh, you know, you get somebody that's 70 years old that got stung by a bee, so they think they're having an allergic reaction. They have some cardiac problems and all that. Do you really want to give them any epi if they don't need it? You know, what's it going to do to their heart? heart rate's going to speed up. If they need it, they need it. But if, you know, make sure they're, they're showing some, preventing some of these symptoms. Get them to take a breath if possible, get them to lay down. Look at the directions. That sounds stupid, but with ours, we know how to use them. Uh, Chief Olden's got a, a demonstrator in his office that you can't read it, it actually tells you. It's a little bitty box. And when you hit the button to start, it tells you, okay, do this, do that. It's like an AED. It actually talks through it in case you want to do it. You know, you
you might go to somebody's house and see these, or you know, you might be off duty. Look at it. If it doesn't look like what we have, read the directions. With ours, you shouldn't have to read them. You should be familiar with them. Again, some of the reactions you might have when you're given the medication is uh, something as simple as a patient passing out. And that's not just with the epi. That could be with anything. But again, we're always going to be reassessing the patient, making sure that we're watching them. When we're given some of these other medicines, if they do have a reaction, you know, we do have the epi ready. The, uh, the advanced, everybody here is at least advanced, right? There. So you can, you can give the epi pen. You have that available. Uh, paramedics, you know, you can go on to the, uh, the actual grown up epi, which is preferred because that's only like $5 a bottle instead of the 120 130 or whatever. Yeah, you've got it there available. For universal precautions, again, we want to make sure that on these sharks, we're not doing like we used to do, where you stick them in the seats. And then as soon as you stick them in the seat, somebody slides over and, get over and you contaminated the seat. We want to make sure as soon as you're using them, you're throwing them away. Make sure you're using your gloves. Make sure you're cleaning up the trucks afterwards. Um, anybody have any questions? or? All right, we're going to break up into two groups. We're going to come up here to the arms. Sorry. <laughs> Can we go now? Oh, <laughs> my balls are back here. Action! All right, I think I'm out of frame now. We should be good. All right, everybody, this is for everybody. Uh, EMTs, paramedics, everybody can do this. Everybody can give these fluids. Uh, we're going to talk about fluid resuscitation. Uh, we're going to talk about some physiology. We're also going to talk about too much fluid. And we all know we can overload these people. We've got to be real careful with that. And we're going to talk about some of the problems we can have with that. We're going to do a few drip calculations. How many are ready to do drip calculations? Reinig's the only one ready to do a drip calculation. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to show you how many have ever done a drip calculation with a real patient in the back of their truck. How many times? You're the first one in three days. Not a drug calculation, right. a drip calculation. Well, I'm going to show you where it is important. We're going to talk about burn patients, and it's really important that they get the right amount of fluid. We've got to be real careful with them. We're going to talk about them, too. Okay? Not too many old people here. A couple of you guys. You remember some of these fluids? You new children. Rutherford. Don't remember. Don't Probably never heard of any D5, except in class. Did they touch on it in class? Y'all talking about it in paramedic school by any chance? So uh, we don't carry D5 anymore. Used to. How about ringers? You know, y'all talking about ringers? A lot of other Well, I found that the guys that are working part-time here, nobody in this area is right now anyway, at least with some of the guys that are working part-time over the last two days anyway. So... Um, we're going to talk about this with burn patients here in a minute with ringers and whatnot. All right, those first three, what type of solutions are they? Isotonic. A little more. There you go, say it out loud. Crystalloids. Okay. The, <laughs> the one on the bottom, colloid. Okay, what are the difference, just a, a quick difference in the two between uh, the crystalloid and the colloid? If we put a crystalloid in the body, can it do the same thing as a colloid? No, what do the colloids do the crystalloids don't? Carry O2 and nutrients, but they do carry O2. 
So you got to be real careful with some of these fluids, these top three. We get too much in, we can't carry oxygen anymore. Okay? Let's talk about resuscitating the medical patient. Uh, granny's out uh, this time of the year. She's getting her garden going, even though today is probably not a really good day of that. But, uh, you know, she gets a little overheated. And uh, now she needs some fluids. Uh, we're going to run a whole bag in her? A bag of a thousand saline? You know? No, probably not. Two to three hundred over what kind of time frame? Fifteen to thirty minutes ish. You know, you don't want to slam it in too fast, then we still have these problems. Okay? So after we get the let's say we gave her two fifty. What do we do next? Reassess her. Right? If she needs some more, can we give her more? Absolutely we can give more. How about the kid? Kid's out playing soccer. He gets a little hot, gets a little dehydrated. He wasn't drinking his, uh, what do you guys drink? Monster, some, I don't know what y'all drink today. Um, you know, yeah, whatever. These children don't drink water. Um, they all got, all right, Rutherford's proving me wrong. He's got a damn <laughs> jug of water. So here we go. Uh, but anyway, he's a little dehydrated. Um, and so we're going to start these kids off with uh, 20 cc's per kilo, right? We can give that. Give it over about the same time frame, you know, uh, 15, 30 minutes. Then what? Reassess. What if he needs some more? Give me some more. How much can we give these kids out in the field before we get downtown? Everybody. You're close. We can give them three doses. Of 20. We can go up to 60. So we do the first 20. Ah, they need some more. Let's give another 20. We're up to 40. We can give another 20. We can go up to 60 in the field. Okay? That's what our protocols let us do. It can be, but you're giving that, we're probably not going to get there, because if you're giving this over 15 to 30 minutes, what are you downtown by the time you leave? How fast? Yeah, so you might get into the second part of it and then are downtown where they can get blood if they need it. If they're in, it depending on the, now our medical patient is probably going to be not going to require the blood. So hopefully after a second dose uh, or somewhere into the second dose, they're going to perk up a little bit. Hopefully. How about a trauma patient? How much fluids can we give the adult trauma patient? So you're being taught 80, Amy's teaching that? Okay. Okay. Radio pulses. If you can feel radio pulses. Last couple of days I've been teaching 90. I'm kind of old school in case you hadn't figured that out. That's enough out of you. We're on tape. Be careful. Uh, but I, we're doing 90. So 80 to 90 is okay. Does that sound low to some of y'all? 90 systolic? Oh, that was a yes or no question, Randy. Okay, so, so to Reinig, after all said and done, sounds a little low. How about y'all? 90 sounds a little low? I'm sorry? Why? A whole bunch of reasons. That's one of them. Let's say we raise it all of a sudden. I say all of a sudden. Let's say we bring their pressure up to 110. What happens to that vessel that's bleeding? It opens up, you're putting more pressure on it, the, wherever that, wherever that uh, a vessel is breached and blood's coming out, it's going to tear that, possibly make it bigger. What if it did have a clot and it was trying to clot itself off? Now we throw that clot, now what kind of problem do we have? A PE. So that's one of the problems we could have if we, if we raise the pressure. So we, we do want to be a little hypotensive. Okay? We're still treating our patient. But if you can get radio pulses hanging around 90 systolic, um, we're probably going to do all right to get them to a trauma center. Okay? Here we go with our, the, the pediatric. Same thing with the, uh, as in the medical patient, 20 per kilo, uh, up to 60, so we can give them three, uh, three boluses, if you will, of, uh, of fluids. Any questions on any of that so far? Okay. 
let's start. Let's let's talk about overloading these people. Here's some of the problems that they we can throw them in, into CHF, right? You got the little old lady that was at her garden, and we throw too much fluid into her, and she's already she's on Lasix already because she's got the CHF problem. It's probably one of my ex. Uh, here we go on tape. I'll stop that one. Uh, which, but <laughs> CHF, we could create some hypertension, can we not? And create a problem there. How much is too much? Keep reassessing them and uh, so and listen to their lungs. Make sure they don't get into CHF or have another problem. You know, that little old lady, she may already be in renal failure. She may be on dialysis and, uh, you know, throwing the fluids to her is it, it really, really could be a problem. So here's our other problem. We talked about it earlier. Um, we're, we're giving our crystalloid solution. We can't carry hemoglobin anymore. So that, that could be a real problem. I'm going to let you all know something I found out yesterday. Captain Pete was sitting over there. And, uh, you know, he flies a helicopter part-time, in case you all didn't know that. Um, damn it. Got to get these facial expressions off the camera. Uh, but he let us know their helicopter service uh, is going to start carrying blood. They're, they're already out with that company as a nationwide company. And they've already got them uh, in spots throughout the nation. And uh, they're going to have a little refrigerator with blood. And they're going to grab a cooler and throw the blood in there on trauma calls and they're going to head on out. So we may need to revisit our, uh, once that happens, we may need to revisit our helicopter option then uh, so to certain patients that may need blood. Because we obviously, we can't start blood in the field, can we? No. Um, there it is. But is it out of the realm of possibilities that we may still get called to Piedmont Fayette and have to take somebody out that's on blood? I realize we're going to have to meet a whole bunch of criteria before they call us nowadays. Um, we're almost basically out of that business, but it's, it's still not out of the realm. Um, you know, and, and I know I'm not on, not on the truck anymore, but I, I mean, if somebody's really sick and needs to go, I don't mind going to get them. You know, a Fayette County resident. Uh, not real thrilled about the people coming here from Fulton. I shouldn't have to take them. But uh, that's, I get into politics with that. But... Uh, if we do, blood's hanging, even though we can't start blood products, we can't transport a patient that is on blood products. So some of the things to watch out for, uh, an allergic reaction. See if they're having hives, if you see something like that, check their temperature often. Uh, really watch their vital signs too. Of course, temperature we know is a good vital sign. And watch that. We can give them some aspirin. We can start some Benadryl. If you, if you, the hemolytic effect that you may or may not notice, you're going to see some of these other signs and symptoms too, but it's probably because that this, the body's killing these donor cells. So, and they're, they're reacting to that. So that's not good. What's, what do you want to do? You got that patient and you see some of these signs and symptoms. What do you guys want to do? Stop, Stop it. Immediately. Yep. They've probably got some maintenance fluids hanging. So go ahead and crank them up a little bit more because they, they may need the volume. But be careful and watch them. Don't overload them with the uh, crystalloid either. Okay? All right, and everybody got the calculators in their pockets? Get you. All right, don't anybody do not. No, no. We're getting this on tape. No, don't touch your calculators. Did everybody see Baker go? He had his calculator. Ah, put your hands on the table. I'm going to give you an easy one. 1,000 cc's. 15 drops set over eight hours. Use the calculator. Scott Baker, he's thinking. I smell some wood burning. Y'all get your calculators out quick. Save this man. Eight hours a minute is 480. Eight hours in minutes is 480 minutes. Yeah, 1,000. I'm going to let you all do 15 drops. Because you all y'all do uh, 10. You've got select right? 10, 15, 60. You, you're, you're pretty versatile. can do a lot of stuff. 
So you take your 1,000, multiply it by 15, 31. divide it by 480, which is eight hours in minutes, and it comes up to 31 and a quarter or something. Boy, those guys yesterday really wanted to get that quarter drop. Uh, they were, they were, it was pretty emphatic about it. So, yeah, drop every two seconds, basically. Okay, and we're going to show you in the burn patients here in just a second how important this is. Everybody else wouldn't admit that they use drip calculations until today. So, thank you. But we'll see how important it is here in a minute when we talk about that. Any questions about drip calculations? Do we need to practice that? It's something we don't see all the time. You know, we probably should be training 90% um, of the time on the things we only do about 5% of the time. And this is, this is rare, except in the master paramedic um, realm over there. So, uh, anybody need to do another one? Because I can throw out more numbers at you. We good? Don't be afraid, it's okay. All right, let's talk about burn patients. Everybody remember the Parkland formula? Jeff Ramsey's all over the Parkland formula. Uh, the Parkland formula used to be four per kilo for the adult. And, and a lot of people still use the Parkland formula. Took a class about this time last year, uh, Advanced Burn Life Support, went to Grady. And we were that far, in our, our little classroom was that far from the burn unit. And we were actually taught, the, 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 the elite instructors, and I wish I could remember, out of Tennessee, is either Vanderbilt or uh, Erlanger, I can't remember which, but they came down from Tennessee. And they're, they're, they used all the instructors that worked in the burn unit. We talked to uh, the uh, physician that was the head of the burn unit. We talked to uh, some PAs and nurse practitioners and nurses that take care of patients every day. Uh, and this is what they use. If you can remember ACE, that the adult gets two per kilo, <clears throat> the child gets three, and any electrical burn gets four. Okay, that is gonna be uh, the amount they need for 24 hours. When you get that amount, half it, because they're gonna get half of that the first eight hours, and then they're gonna take the other half over the next 16 hours. So that's, that's back similar to what the Parkland uh, formula wants. So it's real important, I'll show you why, we'll do a calculation here in a minute, that they get the right amount over the time left, and then we'll, we'll jump back to that here in just a second. So I'll give you all an easy one. I, you got any questions about this right now, though? So the adult is 2 cc and child is 3 cc? Yes. Because of body mass and that's back up. I guess I'm not sure what you're asking because... Like a child is smaller. They require more fluid because they're going to third space this stuff a lot when they get burned a lot because of their... Yeah, that because of their body mass, right? Okay. So what we want to do, I left out one little part. We need to know how much, how many, how much percentage of the burn that the patient has. How do you figure up percentage of burn? Rule of nines is good. Uh, if you can remember that, yeah, the palm of your hand or the palm of the patient's hand, not your hand, because you get a kid. The, the palm of their hand is one percent. So if they can cover up, there's fifty. That's fifty percent. Okay, so we're all pretty good at kind of figuring up roughly uh, what the percentage burns is, are. Okay, so you take that, you multiply your two per kilo, uh, multiply that by the percentage of the body surface area burned, uh, and then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, then you half that, and you're going to give that over eight hours. And then we'll go back to our regular drip formula, okay? So let's do a simple one. Got an adult patient, let's say 100 kilos. He's 200 pounds, 220 pounds, I'm sorry. Uh, so, and he's got, let's say 40% of his body surface area is burned. So we take two times 100 times 40 and everybody comes up with Everybody get 8,000? Baker? So that's, 8,000 is what he needs over 24 hours. So now we want to half that. Let's give 4,000 over the next eight hours. So 
now we take 4,000. Let's do a 10 drop set. Let's make it easy. That'll make the math easy. So that's 40,000 divided by 480, right? Everybody see where I got those numbers? And we come up with 83 drops a minute, 80 drops a minute. So a little faster than a drop a second. And that's what they're gonna, that's what this, this patient should be getting in the first eight hours. It is real important that we start that as soon as we can start that, to get that correctly. When you get up to Grady, then they can, you can tell them, this, I, I did this, and then you can see how much I gave them, and we figured it up this way. Then they're going to take your normal saline, throw it away, and they're going to hook them up the ringers. But they're still going to use what you have given them and figure the rest of the time for what this patient needs over the next 24 hours. So it's still real important that they get this fluid, then manage their pain. We talked about pain management. Captain Roberts did that first. So it's real important. They need fluid and they need pain management. Actually, they're saying the, the room temperature, truck temperature is fine. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to have it necessarily come out of the warmer, but you're right. We don't want them shivering. We want to keep them as comfortable as we can but it doesn't have to be out of the warmer either. We sure don't want cold fluid, you're absolutely right. Any questions on fluid resuscitation? 90 systolic, slightly hypotensive, don't overload them, don't throw them in the CHF or a pulmonary edema or uh, know about their history a little bit so we don't have the renal patient overloaded really quickly. That could be bad too. All right. You got any questions over anything we did today? Y'all make sure and go back, get into your, uh, your national registry and look at that and see where you guys are. <laughs>